Uh, thanks very much for having me here today. Um, as per my introduction, I work for ACOM uh, and I'm here to talk about the Natural Capital Laboratory, uh, which was established in 2019 between ourselves and our partner organisations, uh, the University of Cumbria, the Lifescape Project and the landowners themselves, Emilia and Roger Lees. Uh, I do need to say that I am very much the B team substitute today. Um, our sustainability director and our project manager for the NCL are both uh, unavailable, so uh, I'm here in their place. I'm going to talk over a few people's slides uh, and I'll do my best to do them justice. I think there's a question and answer session later on. Uh, again, I'll do my best to answer questions, but I'll provide some contact details for those guys just in case there's anything I can't answer. So, as I said, the Natural Capital Laboratory uh, was set up in 2019 between ACOM, the Lifescape Project, the University of Cumbria and the site landowners. Uh, we're now in the third year of the project, which uh, was because we didn't manage to do anything during uh, 2020 because of COVID. Um, the site itself is called Birchfield. It's about 100 acres in size, so 42 hectares located near the village of Whitebridge to the east of Loch Ness, about 45 minutes or so south of Inverness. If I skip back to the slide, you can see what the site looks like. Um, it was planted in the mid-1980s uh, with commercial uh, non-native conifers. Uh, you can see in the foreground quite a lot of that has been failed, but there is a remaining uh, stands. There are some remnant patches of native broadleaf woodland, uh, we've identified a small area of raised bog. There's the River Fechlin, which is just out of sight at the bottom of the picture there, which flows down to Loch Ness, and then smaller patches of other habitat on site. So the landowner's aim when they purchase the site, and still remains to be, uh, is to rewild it, uh, which will involve the removal of the non-native conifers and to replace those with native tree species, native plants and native animals. The Natural Capital Laboratory was set up with the aim of supplementing that work with innovative approaches to data collection and monitoring. So for example, uh, some of the ways in which we've been collecting data over the last few years, and I'll touch on these a bit more in the coming slides, but we've been using drones, remote sensing, thermal imaging, uh, motion sensitive camera traps, robotic rovers and artificial intelligence. The heart rate monitors one is quite interesting because the, the landowners and the Natural Capital Laboratory are keen that it isn't just a, an environmentally focused project, there's a social element as well. So some volunteers that were doing work on the site were strapped up with heart rate monitors and had their blood pressure taken to try and um, at least qualitatively assess how their physiology changed from being out in nature. And it seemed to show that actually it was beneficial both in terms of heart rate and uh, blood pressure. The Natural Capital Accounting, which I'll come on to uh, briefly in a second, um, provides a means to measure both the environmental and the social impacts of the project and to quantify how that changes as the site is rewilded. It gives us a, a way of estimating values both in terms of the uh, physical flows, the ecosystem services provided by the site, but also assigning a monetary value to those which allows us to actually uh, form an account in the traditional sense. And key to the work of the Natural Capital Laboratory is to communicate what we're doing. Uh, I don't know if anyone watches Country File, but there was an entire episode filmed there and aired a couple of months ago. Um, but in, a, in addition to that, uh, we've used virtual reality, interactive maps, um, digital platforms and other method, methods to engage both with stakeholders and the local community. So digital natural capital accounting. Um, for those that don't know, natural capital is a term which refers to all of the living and non-living elements of the natural environment which provide benefits to people. So for example, the air that we breathe, the soil that we grow crops in, minerals, plants and animals. And the flowchart at the bottom there just provides a, a really basic example of that where the woodland habitat and the trees which comprise it uh, are the, the natural capital stocks, so your assets, the physical flows or the ecosystem uh, services that they provide are 
but many, but in this case, uh, water storage. So the trees take up the water from the rainfall and provide flow regulation, and then providing uh, a, a monetary value, both in terms of here, uh, reduced flood risk and the reduced uh, cost of damages to property downstream. Natural capital accounting is an approach that's been developed by DEFRA, uh, the Natural Capital Coalition and the Natural Capital Committee for measuring and valuing the benefits of natural capital and for organising it in a way that allows for any impacts upon it to be assessed alongside a traditional uh, monetary accounting approach. And it allows for an understanding of nature which provides uh, flows of services to deliver benefits uh, and, and, and establishing a framework uh, to manage land in a way which benefits society. So the traditional typical approach to natural capital accounting, you won't be surprised to see, involves Microsoft Excel. Um, it can be pretty complicated as there may be multiple tabs which are all interlinked, um, complicated formulae which are again connected between tabs and it's therefore a pretty technical task. The values which are used um, are set at the time the account is um, compiled uh, and are typically based on available published literature, so might not be specific to your site and therefore uh, perhaps not a realistic representation. It all needs to be updated manually as well and it just makes for something that's quite difficult for non-technical specialists to understand. So what ACOM did at the Natural Capital Laboratory was to develop the first ever digital natural capital account. Um, it's web-based, it's available online for anyone to access, it's interactive, so you can uh, navigate around the website and see uh, what's been going on and the actual account itself. It's also informed not only by the work that we're doing on site, so peak probing here, but also through remote sensing and using machine learning to update it in near real, te uh, real time. So it, the values that it presents are, are right up to date. If this video works. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's okay, I can describe the black screen. Um, I'll, I'll move on from the black screen, but I will describe it. Um, there's a link at the end of the presentation to the uh, digital natural capital account. Like I say, it's just a website. Um, there's a landing page where you um, can find out, or anyone who's interested, information about the project, uh, maps and figures, videos, drone footage, so that you get an understanding of what the site is. But there are navigation tools down the side which allow you to really delve into some of the data that's been collected in more detail. So there's interactive maps for um, habitats, so you can click on any part of the site and it'll bring up information on the habitat at that location. Similarly, in, in the image previously was a, a guy doing some peat probing. You can click any part of the site and it'll tell you what the peat depths are there, uh, which really helps in terms of management decisions because you can say, okay, well, there's deep peat here. This isn't somewhere we want to go and plant new native trees or whatever. And this uh, screen here helpfully shows what the actual um, monetary account looks like. Um, I won't go into too much detail on it, but you can see down the left-hand side are the different natural capital assets, so obvious things like timber, water supply and so on, and then some of the more social elements of that as well. The numbers, the, the monetary values are in thousands of pounds, so it's not 13 pounds for energy. Um, and the values are for the baseline year, so the year the Natural Capital Laboratory was set up in 2019, and for the reporting year, year 2020-2021. Some of the uh, interesting figures there, you can see a red for disease and pest control, um, so there's been a reduction in value in, in that regard, and that's been due to the costs incurred uh, with trying to remove non-native Sika deer from the site. So the landowners are, are strict vegans, um, they've offered books on veganism, and if you want to visit the site, you cannot take any food with animal-based products in it, and that includes cereal with honey. Um, and so, rather than adopting the traditional approach to managing deer on site, which involves culling, they've trialled the use of drones to round up and scare deer off site. So that's the reason for the reduction in value there. There's also a slight reduction in the support and contribution that is because of the COVID hiatus. And then perhaps quite interestingly is under intellectual capital where you can see some of the biggest numbers. Um, that, those figures have actually been calculated by ACOM based on the 
um, work that we have won from clients uh, where they've indicated that our involvement in the Natural Capital Laboratory was a key uh, distinguishing feature between our competitors in competitive bids. So, uh, you know, return on investment straight away there. So, um, in terms of data collection, um, alongside more traditional methods, we have uh, been uh, trialling various innovative approaches. Um, the image at the top right there shows um, drone flight paths. So they've been set up and can be flown precisely exactly the same every time we go back to the site. So it's replicable season after season, season uh, year after year, and allows us to collect a really good and replicable data set to see how the site changes um, as it rewilds. Uh, we've also been using multi-spectral cameras with RTK positioning, which I know nothing about, but uh, is, is a very accurate way of uh, positioning obviously. So um, if you input the site boundary, it will every time know exactly where that site boundary is and collect exactly the right data for you. Uh, the two images there show an area of grass uh, pictured with a normal camera. The image on the right um, shows soil moisture content, so again provides us with some more information uh, on site condition, habitat condition that informs our uh, uh, natural capital account. This, uh, I think Paul mentioned digital twin. This is our digital twin of the uh, site. So you can think back to the image earlier. It's a really powerful tool to allow us to model different management interventions and to see what that would do in terms of um, uh, affecting the ecosystem services and thus the natural capital account. So for example, if we wanted to see how uh, <coughs> felling an area of the existing commercial crop would affect hydrology, you can do that, you can run hydrological models and see what that would mean in terms of surface water flows and water quality. So that's an incredibly powerful tool. And again, just to link this back to rail, something that could be uh, certainly done on rail projects and again allows for sustainable land management decisions to be made before any spade goes into the ground. So just to talk about one of the work streams that we've uh, been uh, carrying out on the site in terms of aquatic ecology, which has been uh, done by my colleague Pete Cowley and our partners at Nature Metrics, who specialise in uh, biodiversity data collection through eDNA. Um, the slides are a little bit busy here, but I'll do my best to summarise them. Um, essentially, in the first year of the NCL, the work of the aquatic ecology team really involved a desk-based study, so collecting as much data as they could on water quality, uh, species records and so on, with the uh, aim of scoping up the interesting surveys for year two. Um, this uh, is a map showing their survey location, so you can see the site boundary in red. They had survey uh, points upstream at Loch Kellen, uh, through the site and then downstream towards Loch uh, Ness. You might think that in a highland location like this, the river would be um, completely pristine, but there are uh, existing and proposed hydro schemes within the catchment. Uh, there's also natural barriers to fish movement, so the falls of foyers there uh, prevent the movement of migratory uh, fish species, so there's no Atlantic salmon on site. And this is just a summary of the survey methods that they carried out. Uh, you can see they did traditional surveys for macroinvertebrates, so uh, in, in insects in the water, diatoms, macrophytes, which plant, fish, and freshwater pearl mussels. But alongside that, they uh, collected water samples for eDNA analysis. And eDNA stands for environmental DNA, and it is essentially, some of you may be aware from Greek crested newts, uh, animals, when they are in or near the water, shed DNA, which then enters the water and becomes a kind of DNA soup that um, the laboratory is able to uh, analyse and compare against genomic sequences to determine species that are present. So again, um, from this slide, the most interesting graph is the top left, which is taxon richness, uh, which is another way of saying the number of species. The lines in blue and orange uh, are the number of species recorded through the traditional survey methods at each sampling location and the grey line is the number of species recorded by the eDNA analysis. So you can see that at every monitoring point there were more species detected by the eDNA analysis than were by the traditional survey methods. And that, that increased the, the disparity between the um, 
to methods increased as you went downstream, so the lower fecalin being the most downstream, and that's because you are picking up DNA more and more as you move down the watercourse and it's being flushed downstream. So some of the species that were found, uh, macrum vertebrates, the top right there is the upland summer mayfly, it's very rare. The bottom right is, I think, even rarer because it doesn't have a common name. It's called Capnia atra, which is restricted to Scotland. You'll notice up to 54 species of non-biting midge were identified, which is quite amazing. Uh, and all of those species indicated that the water quality was, was really good. Um, oh, too far. Uh, I won't go into this because I can't, but... Um, Essentially, it's an incredibly simple survey method. Um, it doesn't require any specialist training or knowledge. It's simply a case of collecting a water sample which gets sent to the laboratory for analysis. So it's quick and it's easy, it's very replicable, and anyone can collect a high quality sample. And these are the results. Um, a total of six fish species, 26 vertebrates, and 136 macro vertebrates detected <coughs> through the eDNA sampling. Many of these are of conservation concern, so European eel are internationally of conservation concern. But you'll also see that not only was it picking up aquatic or even just amphibious species, but also terrestrial species. So we picked up the DNA of golden eagle, uh, ptarmigan, which is a, a montane bird, uh, several mammals, water shrew, water vole, which some of you will be a bit familiar with as well. So really quite amazing, a useful tool for establishing a robust baseline data set. And in addition, uh, there was uh, DNA detected which was a close but imperfect match for Arctic char, which is a species of fish which is restricted to deep uh, upland uh, lochs or lakes in England. Um, the guys aren't absolutely certain that it is Arctic char and are, the theory may be that it could belong to the Hadi char, which is either a subspecies or a spe uh, separate species from Arctic char. Um, you'll see the scientific name there, Salvalinus killinensis, so it's actually named after Loch Killen, which is just upstream of the site. So it has a very restricted distribution. And so what the team want to do going forward is to try and collect some more DNA, ideally a tissue sample from fish, to look at this further and see whether it is in fact its own species rather than just a subspecies of, of Arctic char. And that's really both interesting and valuable because the IUCN um, uh, classify it as being vulnerable. So as I mentioned, um, one of the key things we want to do with the Natural Capital Laboratory is make sure that the work we're doing is communicated and that the lessons we've learned are shared. So one of the ways we're doing that is through the use of immersive visualisation and oralisation technology. So the team have um, been taking the data collected by others working at the NCL, so for example the aquatic ecology team or, or my own terrestrial ecologists, and they've been building a three-dimensional three model of the site. <coughs> they've done this by taking 360 degree videos in various habitats across the site, collecting sound, uh, sounds from the same locations and building a virtual reality to simulate how it looks now and how it might look um, over the next hundred years. And they can be really very detailed and specific with this down to the level of individual plant species. So if we as terrestrial ecologists say there's heather present or there might be this species present now, we can build digital models of those to include into the virtual reality world. Um, and it really is a powerful tool for uh, helping people to understand what it is that we're trying to do and what it might look like in future. So that's sort of a screenshot of what the world looks like and you can see the level of detail in terms of the ferns and the grass and again what it might look like in 50 years and again it keeps going on. This is a video that is not going to work, but um, you, it shows you walking around the world and you can go and pat the moose and all sorts of stuff. So it's good. And again, uh, something I think that's very applicable to rail projects. Um, it's such a powerful tool for stakeholder engagement. Um, we work on lots of projects where um, the aim is to deliver biodiversity net gain. So if you're looking at creating or enhancing an area of habitat, you can build a virtual reality of that, which allows members of the public or statutory organisations to see what it is that you want to do. 
And not only that, but you can set expectations by having um, periods of time where you show people what it might look like in the first year or the first five years so that people don't think that it's going to be some beautiful woodland or hay meadow the year after you've been and built something massive. So biodiversity monitoring then, um, this work's being carried out by uh, the University of Cumbria. Um, the aim is to um, set up a replicable way of automatically monitoring biodiversity change as the site rewilds. So they've set up 10 monitoring stations across the site. Um, each station is equipped with two motion sensitive trail cameras which can collect video or camera, uh, video or still images. Uh, both during daylight and at night. There's also uh, audio moths, which are really cheap but really effective um, noise monitoring uh, pieces of kit. So they can record bird sounds and also bats. And the guys at the University of Cumbria are currently analysing the data from the first year. And you can see that there's a lot to go through. So from one location alone, they've got 2,000 images to look through. And that's just an example of uh, what they look at, that's a, a non-native seeker deer. So in terms of the future then, um, we've got lots on the go and we keep coming up with more ideas. Um, my colleague who was carrying out a, a habitat survey identified a previously unknown area of raised bog just beside the river here. Um, nobody knew it was there because it was so badly degraded through drainage ditches um, that were dug for the commercial plantation and also the encroachment of of um, birch scrub, so we have a programme of ongoing uh, hydrological monitoring and uh, what we really hope to do is to come up with a plan for how that area might be restored through ditch blocking and the removal of scrub uh, with the aim of really bringing it back to a, a nice bog with the carbon sequestration benefits that would bring. Uh, I've said it before as well, it's not just environmental, there's very much a social aspect to this. So there have been artists in residence, and there will continue to be, so there's people have recorded music albums on site. Uh, there's also work taking place to identify missing species from the site, uh, and the possibility of reintroducing those. Um, we're not talking about wolves, but smaller things like uh, wood ants and things like that, that, that would naturally be in that area, but are currently missing. And uh, my colleague who manages this is really trying to expand the Natural Capital Laboratory to form part of a, a network of sites across the world and is having some success with that uh, with people, I think, in Africa and Australia. And the idea would be to share all that we've learned and, and really uh, yeah, come up with better ways of doing things. That's that. Thank you very much.